Hey, this is Joe Gilder from Personas, and you may be wondering, why is there a timer at the bottom of the screen? I'll tell you why. Uh, I'm going to mix a song in 30 minutes using Studio One from Personas. Now, why would I do that? Uh, part of me wanted to just show you a bunch of mixing features, but I don't know. You've probably watched your fair share of software demos. I want to make this a little more fun. And, and one of the ways that I actually got into Studio One uh, years ago, we're on version five now, back on version two, was I watched a few people work in it um, and saw how they got around and realized well, that, that might be worth trying out. So that's what I want to do for you. Obviously, I'm incredibly biased. I work for Personas, but uh, I was using Studio One long before I became a software product specialist at Personas. So we're going to start with a blank session and we're going to mix a song. So uh, I'm going to open my template, but I'm actually not going to use it. We'll just, we'll just, we're just going to run with it. So a uh, blank session here. Let me get rid of all of this. And we've got an empty, 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 very, very empty session here. And I've got a folder full of files uh, that I had a friend of mine send to me. Uh, and I've not mixed this song yet. So I'm going to drag these in and make sure they copy over. So one of the things I love about Studio One is it's allowed me to have a nice, quick mixing workflow. Uh, and some of that is just because of the way it... I mentioned this in my other presentation, if you've not seen that. Uh, the way Studio One kind of molds itself to my workflow rather than forcing me into a certain workflow, especially when it comes to mixing. Um, I'm a big fan of a less is more approach to mixing and of a top-down kind of method to mixing, which means instead of going in and doing EQs and compressors on my drums, I'd much rather um, EQ and compress the drum bus and see how good I can get it to sound from there before jumping in. So this song, it's a pretty cool song called Looking for L. Not a huge number of tracks, and I believe the drums are easy drummers. The first thing I'm going to do is get my session organized. So I tend to follow a bit of a, a process that I do every time I mix a song. And the first is to get it organized. Now, normally this is done inside of a template that I save in Studio One that has all the, the folders and buses that I'm gonna show you already set up. Uh, however, I wanted to show you everything from scratch here because you're gonna, when you download Studio One, you're gonna be starting from scratch as well. So I don't wanna um, start from a starting point that's not the same as you so I can get you up and running with it as well. So right now I'm just putting things in the order that I like them. Uh, I'm gonna putting, these are electric, Get, oops, these are electric guitars, I believe, uh, and this will all make sense in just a second. Um, I tend to, and I would recommend you do the same, organize things in such a way that it's the same every time. I know we're creative, we're musicians, we don't like to back ourselves into a corner, but I really like the idea of my drums are always blue. And so, and they're always on the far left of the session, so I can always go and quickly find what I need to find um, because I color code them the same way every time. Now, there's a couple of cool ways you can do this in Studio One, um, and let me show you right now. So I'm going to select all my drums and percussion tracks, and I have them in the order that I want. I'm going to right-click on them and choose Pack Folder, okay? Now, this creates a little folder that I can open and close. That's pretty cool. But what's better than that is I can name this Dur Drums. Drums. I can't even type. Cannot type. Drums. All right, that's cool. But I can change the color of the folder, and guess what? It changes the color of all the drums. That saves me a little bit of time. And I can click right here, and I can say Add Bus Channel. Um, actually, hang on. I need to delete some of this extra stuff that's in my session that I did not mean to be in here because I want to start from a blank slate. Hold on. Ignore the man behind the curtain. We're deleting these. These were just from my template that I imported. Okay, we're good. Uh, so now I'm going to select this folder. I'm going to click this little button here and say add bus channel. What did it do? It created a bus, you see that little knob there? Now I've got a fader on my drums and if I go over to the mixer, I can now see all these blue channels are my drums. I can pack them up into a folder which will actually, if I change a setting here, uh, yeah, I can pack the folder both in the mixer window as well as the arranger window and they're all blue and all of these drums are now feeding into this drum bus. Now we just have to repeat this process uh, a few more times to get all of our other tracks. So let's put, there's acoustics, let's make one for them. 
I've assigned a keyboard shortcut to some of this to make it a little quicker. And I actually, like I said before, I actually have all of this set up in my template. So I have these folders sitting here waiting for me. And then I just drag tracks into them. And what happens is, I'm going to call this bass. I'm not going to make a bus for the bass. A lot of times I do, but just not, not today. Not today. Um, and what happens is if, if I create the buses and create the folders um, and then drag a track into the folder, guess what? That track automatically gets routed to the output of that folder. Let me show you. Let's do this. Let's do uh, create. Let's do this. I'm going to pack these first two guitars into a folder. We'll call this. Wow. I can't, wow. I can't type today. This is amazing. Uh, and you may think, Joe, you got 24 minutes left. Why are you focusing on this? Because this, kind of the whole sharpening the axe thing, getting this done is going to help me mix faster down the road. So this is my electric bus. I'm going to create a bus for that, okay? I got a folder and a bus now. Oh, no, I forgot to put this one in there. Look, this track is routed to my main outputs. I actually want it to go to my electric guitar bus. Whatever shall I do? I just drag it into the folder. Joink. It's in the folder. You can see that now. It's packed in the folder. And then if we look at that track, look. It's now routed to my electric bus. It did the routing for me. I did. I've. Do you know the last time I actually clicked on the little routing buttons here, inside of Studio One? I just don't because these folders do it for me. All right, let's put the bass up here next to the drums. Right there. Uh, let's swap the electrics and the acoustics there. All right, background vocals, keys. Keys are next. This is the one part I. Uh, oops, I almost. I put the keys in the acoustic bus. That was a mistake. I almost didn't do this video because I thought, I don't want to set up folder tracks, but then I, this is the kind of stuff I like to see. I like to see how someone actually works with the system. So here's my keys bus. Keys are usually some shade of orange or salmon. That'll work. Um, let's put the keys here. Um, and then here are my background vocals. We will make a bus for them. Um, and, and there's a couple of things going on here. Obviously, the routing, the color coding, that's all important and super helpful. Uh, background vocals are purple, by the way. Uh, we got two different lead vocals. I'm going to put them both in a bus. We'll just call it the Vox bus and make that yellow. But the, the purpose behind this is, yes, to do routing and color because that really does save me time. But also, it, it, it mirrors my workflow. Um, like I said before, I like to work kind of like this. So we just imported how many tracks? We imported 23 tracks into this session. But when I look at this, I see six colors, six buses, drums, electric guitars, acoustic guitars, keys, vocals, background vocals. That's it. That's kind of the way I'm thinking about this session. So now you can see how, well, yeah, I could mix six tracks in 22 minutes. But maybe you don't think you can mix 23 tracks in 22 minutes. That's the idea. I'm going to mix these as a whole, rather than as individual tracks where I've got to put plugins on every single fader. Now my bass track accidentally got put in. This bass track is being naughty. I'm going to fix that right now. Okay. All right, now bass is where it needs to be. Uh, sometimes I would actually create a folder for bass as well. I'm not doing it today because I just don't want to waste more time. So now what do we do? Well, one thing I want to do is I know I love the fat channel inside of Studio One. So I'm going to open up my browser that I usually leave open while I'm mixing. And I've got things generally in alphabetical order so I can just drag fat channel onto here. And look what it does. If I have them all selected, it put a fat channel on every track. That's pretty cool. That's handy. Now I have those there. I don't need the plugins yet. They're not doing anything to the sound. Next, what I need to do, and this is where things start to get fun, is I'm going to spend the next probably five minutes or so getting a good static mix of everything. That means getting just, just adjusting fader levels and panning, and that's it. So I've got my volume fader at zero. Um, I've got my all my faders at zero, and I'm going to come in here and make sure I can see these input controls. This is a trim knob at the top of every channel, and I'm going to use that to adjust my volume so I can leave my faders at zero and adjust the volumes of the trim coming into it so that my faders stay nice and high. Real quick, why do I do that? What happens if, 
if I move this fader like this, a little movement like this, like I'm using a trackpad, I'm moving my fingers up and down, I mean, just maybe a centimeter or so, and it's moving, you know, six or so dB. That's a doubling of volume. Well, let's say this track is super loud, and I need to turn it down because it's too loud, it's clipping everything. Well, guess what? That same movement here, let's look right, focus your attention right here on that number. I'm doing that same motion with my fingers, and it's going from, it was what? Starting at negative 29, going up to negative 14, that's a difference of 15 decibels. That's over 12 decibels. That is over twice a difference in volume for the same physical movement. Faders are logarithmic, meaning you get more resolution up here. A tiny movement here is just a decibel or two. A tiny movement down here could be two or three times the, the volume which isn't helpful. So I would rather keep my faders here. That means I set my volume for my speakers at the same level every time. I never touch my volume knob. Um, I never touch my master fader. It's at zero. And if I hit play and these tracks are too loud, which I have a sneaky suspicion they might be, I turn them down before they ever hit the fader. And one of the ways you can do that is using these trim knobs here. Now, I have heard these tracks just because I... Um, I Let me just turn these... I'm going to turn these buses down uh, because I listened to them just to make sure they were working, but I haven't mixed them yet, but I remember them being fairly loud. So I'm going to turn down all my main buses, and we're going to start with the drums, get some levels there, bass. We'll go through and just make sure we have le decent levels for everything before we ever put a plug-in on. Why do we do that? I call it a static mix. We do that because... So many problems you face in your mix are because you didn't get balances right. You've got, you know, the bass guitar is just too loud and you're trying to fix it with EQ and compression when really the problem was it was just too loud. Just turn it down. That's because you, you jumped too quickly to using plugins and you didn't sit back and really make sure you got a nice static mix where you set the levels and got all the relative balances between everything. I'm not talking about setting everything even. I'm saying set it balanced, meaning we can hear the things we need to hear. We've got the, the right balance between things. Drums are nice and prominent. We can hear the guitars. We can hear the bass. Nothing's overly too loud, but nothing's like hidden either. And a lot of that just happens by moving the panning up and down and faders left and right. So I'm going to hit play. Actually, before I hit play, I'm going to do something here. I am going to... There's a little feature here where I can hide the buses and just see the audio tracks. I'm just going to bring all of these down with the trim knob here and hit play right in the middle of the song just to see where my volumes are so I don't blow your ears out. Okay, we can't even hear all the tracks because I turned the faders down. I just realized that. Um, but that the drums aren't like blowing our heads off. I did notice that my electric guitars were coming through. So I'm going to turn those down as well. All right, so let's, let's rewind. Let's go to what looks like kind of the biggest portion of the song, which is kind of right here. Let's just loop that section. And let's just get levels. So I'm going to mute my microphone for a minute, and we're going to get some levels here. And then I'll come back and talk to you about what I did. Okay, I just found where there was a spot with the tom, so I could hear that. Let me go find a spot where the hi-hat is playing something. Does it play here in the verse? Just barely.
setting level for the bass, try to match it with the kick drum. So they're kind of two of the same. A lot of people talk about, I don't want my bass and kick drum to interfere. They're the same thing. The bass goes, if they're, they're the boom. The bass is the B of the letter, of the word boom. The, or the kick drum is the B, the bass guitar is the oom. Boom. That makes a sound together. So I don't mind if they're on top of each other because they sound good together. So make sure those two play nicely together. That tambourine's killing me. Is it killing you too? Yeah, right there. Let's turn that whole percussion track down a little bit. Yeah, and that part was too loud. So you can do it. There's a couple ways to deal with a specific thing that's just too loud. It jumped out and scared me a little bit. You can use the clip gain envelopes that we have. Sometimes for something like this, I'll just do this. Just pull it down. Okay, now you might be thinking, I mean, the fact that you're here, thanks for sticking around. Um, what What's going on? We spent, granted, I've done a decent amount of talking, which is what you have to do, but we got 12 minutes and five seconds to go. I've not touched a plug-in yet. And to most people, that's insanity. Like, you gave yourself 30 seconds to mix a song, you spent... You basically spent, if rough numbers, 10 minutes setting it up and getting everything in the right place, another 10 minutes or 8 minutes setting the levels. When are you going to do the good stuff? That's the point. Listen to how good this sounds without any plugins. It is a fun game that I never get tired of playing, which is how good can I make this sound before I slap plugins on here? And then once I do that, guess how much more fun mixing is? A huge, huge, like you can't even measure it, difference. Uh, because I've done my job here. Now, a big piece you might be saying is, well, Joe, my tracks don't sound that good. Take a note then. If your tracks don't sound this good, your mixes won't sound this good. So focus on getting really great sounding tracks that sound like a mix without any plugins. That's the secret. That's the thing that all the plugin companies don't want us to believe. And okay, it's not a conspiracy, but that's the thing we tend to want to believe. The narrative in our heads is the reason that mix is great is because that guy used really great plugins or is a really good mix engineer. Sure, that might be a piece of it. But a bigger piece of it is the person who recorded and produced it did a great job and the tracks already sounded good. That's the, the takeaway shouldn't be like, ah, nothing to learn here. I, my tracks don't sound that good. The takeaway should be, 
the thing I'm learning here is forget the mixing, go make your tracks sound good. And you can. You don't need super, super high-end equipment to get good sounding tracks. This was recorded by two of my VIP members in home studios. I, I, was, I would doubt they use anything more than like a $300 microphone and some software to pull this off. I think the drums are easy drummer, and I think it's a guitar amp modeler and just... It, You've heard it probably a thousand times. You don't need all the fancy stuff. Okay, let's dive into this. So one thing I'm going to do is open up uh, our console shaper plugin, uh, which is kind of like it's built into Studio One. Nobody knows about this. And it basically has the sound of a console across the buses. So it behaves like those plugins you've seen that you put on every channel that make the mixer sound like an analog mixer. We have that built into Studio One Professional. So I'm gonna turn that on and just kind of crank up the drive a little bit and see how it sounds, and then we'll go from there. So Crosstalk is, is mimicking like there's a little bit of the bass in the drum channel, a little bit of drums in the bass channel. It actually ends up for some reason sounding cool because that's what analog you know mixers used to do. So I just set that, get turn some things up till it sounds kind of cool, then I just leave it alone. All right, next thing I want to do is let's get some bus compression on the on the the mix bus. Since the mix already sounds pretty good, I don't hear any huge problems. I'm gonna do some bus compression and start our top down process. Start with the top the buses and work our way down to the channels. So here's our mix bus. I've got the Brit Comp, which is one of the plugins you get. Um, if you're a Persona Sphere member, you get access to all of our add-on plugins that come for our fat channel. This is one of the ones that you get. Sounds really cool. added a little bit of glue underneath the low end just changes even if there's not much compression happening it just does something to the low end that's wonderful so now we're going to kind of rewind i'm going to mute everything go back to the drums and we're going to tweak the drums and kind of re-tweak everything so i've got a fat channel on the drums we're going to use we'll use this compressor this eq that's great let's go I love it. We, we, the drums went from sounding like this to this. That mid-range on the, on the snare drum is tamed a little bit. Everything's got a little bit more squash to it. It's not a huge night and day difference, but I really dig it. And we'll even give ourselves a little tiny bump in the low end too. A little tighter. Sounds pretty good. I'm gonna leave it alone. Let's go on to the bass. What you got for me, Mr. Bass? A little kind of optical compression, a little bit of EQ. I might do, let me put another EQ on here. Just to tame that, there's a lot of mid-range there. Helps that bass sound a little deeper um, there. Uh, 
All right, don't have much time. I don't do a lot on my electric guitar buses because they can sound wildly different, but I do sometimes do a little b bump at 360 just to give it a little extra warmth without adding any muddiness. little low pass filter to kind of smooth out the top end. Sometimes digital amps get a little too crispy for me. That should be fine. Acoustic guitar, I'm not gonna do much to. It sounds good. These are meant to be kind of brighter, um, adding something to the mix, so we're gonna probably leave them like that. All right, keyboards. Keyboards can oftentimes have too much kind of in the 700 hertz range, like right in here. So a little cut there can help. Running out of time, I gotta get to the vocals. Let's do the background vocals first. Uh, we'll go to the chorus. Oh goodness, I lost, got, I lost track of myself. Here we go. Let's find out where the, where the background vocals sing right here. Here we go. She's so you know what, I'm gonna use a regular EQ because that's generally what I use in this situation. Real simple, low cut, bring some mids down, boost some of those highs. Now everyone's looking for hell. Everyone's praying that she's so right. Everyone's looking for hell. And with two minutes to go, let's, <laughs> let's look at the lead vocal here. Uh, there's two vocals going to this lead vocal bus. It doesn't bother me, because um, I kind of like to treat them the same and they kind of glue together. But mostly it's just this one vocal. So I'm gonna focus on this and go back and see what the other vocal's doing. But here we go. Okay, he's singing lower, and then the background vocals are singing higher. I don't want him to be boomy, so a little bit of a high pass. Let's compress him first. Now everyone's looking for real. Now everyone's looking for real. Everyone's praying she's all right. So it's just compressing the louder notes, not the quieter ones. Now everyone's looking for real. That feels good. Um, I want it to be a little brighter. It's kind of muffled sounding. Now everyone's looking for real. Everyone's praying she's all right. Everyone's looking for real. Now everyone's looking for real. Everyone's praying she's all right. I need a de-esser real quick. We've got a de-esser preset on our compressor. I'm just gonna dial it in. I don't have much time to show you. It uses a side chain to just listen to the high frequencies. Now everyone's looking for real. Everyone's praying she's all right. Okay, that's cool. That's great. And what's this other vocal doing? He comes in. I always get I get so sweaty here at the end. Uh, okay, here's this vocal. Years later. And that's that's the mix, right? Um, let's let's get a, let's play back the chorus with 37 seconds left to see what we got. Um, but that's it. This is mixing in Studio One. It's fun. I never get tired of it. Thanks for watching. Yeah.